Welcome to my vlog. Just kidding. Um, I mean, I guess it's a vlog, but. Hi, Clark. Hi, cutie. What are you doing? <gasps> hey, are you excited for Mama to have surgery? Are you excited? Who's excited? Help. Hi friends, it is Sarah Kate. It is August 16th. Yes, it is August 16th, 2020. And I am in my bedroom doing a little work, catching up before my surgery, which is on Tuesday in two days. Um, and I'm just here to talk a little bit about that process and pull together a vlog of sorts about my experience so that other people who go through it can watch this and get a little bit of insight. Um, I know through this process, I have watched like a million YouTube videos, like a million, um, of non-binary individuals, trans folk, female to male trans individuals getting this surgery and their entire process of it. Um, of course, every individual is different, Everybody's story is different, everybody's experience is different, but at least it helped me get some sort of clarity about what I'm going to go through and that people have gone through this before me. So if this is you thinking about going through top surgery or you have a friend or a loved one who is going to go through top surgery, please watch this. Please watch a bunch of other videos as well. And don't just take it from me. Don't just take it from one other person or a friend who's gotten the surgery. Do your research, um, watch different things and talk to people who've gotten the surgery. Um, I hope this helps, ooh, there's my finger. I hope this helps at least one person um, kind of get to a point where they're more comfortable with getting surgery, more comfortable talking about surgery, whatever that may be for them. Um, I hope this helps somebody. And if not, at least I can look back and watch my journey. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my process of getting to where I am right now, which is two days pre-op, um, which is really crazy. I don't know how I got here. Feels like it took forever, but it also feels like it was very easy and it should have been harder for me. Um, I know it's hard for a lot of people to get the surgery, to get it approved, to find the right surgeon, to have the funds to do it. So I'm aware that I'm very blessed and this has worked out very nicely for me um, so far. Fingers crossed. Um, so yeah. Sorry, that was a dog scratching at the door. If you are trying to get top surgery, step number one is research. Um, look into it. There are so many different surgeons who specialize in this. There are so many different types of surgery that you can get, different specializations, different options for different body types, um, depending on your breast shape and size pre-op. Um, you can find a specific surgeon who can give you the kind of surgery that you are looking for um, and that will work for your body as well. There are like so many different options that you can take for um, aesthetic reasons, for health reasons, how you want the surgery to be done and what you want it to look like after your results. Um, personally, I chose double incision because of the size of my chest. Um, I actually haven't had a real bra in like 10 years, so I really have no idea what size my chest is, but I did a little measurement with a tape measure and used a chart online. It says I'm a triple D. I hope I'm not a triple D. But anyway, because of the size of my chest, I was required to get double incision um, as opposed to a periareolar, which is, did I say that right? I think I said that right. Anyway, it is when you cut around the nipple, basically take everything out and then put the nipple back on um, without having to have long lengthwise scars across your chest. Um, people who have smaller chests opt for this surgery because the results, um, if you don't necessarily want scars, give you that option. I don't mind the scars personally. I think scars are cool. I think scars make you unique. And with my skin type and the way that I've scarred before, I'm pretty sure my scars will fade to 
um, a light pink, um, but if not, I'm planning to get tattoos over them anyway, so I don't really mind having scars. Um, as long as I have a flat chest, I am a happy camper. Um, I have three close friends who've gotten this procedure done, like people I know in person, people that I've met and talked to a bunch about this, um, and not to mention the internet friends. I have so many people on the internet who have gone through this, who I've reached out to, who have been open to questions and sharing their pre-op and post-op photos. So for you guys, thank you. That is the reason why I'm making this video because I would not even be here today talking about this or having this procedure done if I didn't have the support and the um, knowledge from people on the internet who are willing and open to talk about this procedure. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all my trans and MB friends who have gone through this and who have helped my process. So, oh, hey, thank you for that guys. I had to make the decision on nipple grafts or no nipple grafts. Um, and I basically made this decision um, personally for myself based on health and healing as well as aesthetic reasons. Um, I chose no nipple grafts. Um, originally, I thought that I would have nipple grafts. I thought that that's how I pictured myself and that's kind of the only thing I had seen represented. Um, and then I started to see people recommending um, no nipples for people who have healing tissue healing problems um just in general like slow healing or um aesthetic reasons like i said some people don't get this surgery to pass as male um they're not female to male transgender they are non-binary gender queer um agender whatever it may be um, a lot of people choose no nipple grafts as a way to appear more neutral uh, because you don't need nipples um Unless, uh, I don't know, do we even need nipples? During the healing process, a lot of people don't necessarily like the way their nipples look afterwards. A lot of people lose sensation completely or partially. Um, it takes a long time for sensation to come back in general. In the nipples, um, when you have free nipple grafts, um, yeah, some people don't like the color, the the healing, they lose pigment. There's so many different things. People lose nipples, like fall off. I don't wanna worry that my nipples are gonna fall off. It's not something I ever wanted to do. So let's just remove them. We'll go with that. So that's the reason why I chose it. Um, but there are, again, a multitude of reasons why somebody might choose to have nipples or to not have nipples. Um, but I personally chose not to. And um, my doctor was fine with that, which, by the way, my surgeon is Dr. Ramanini. Um, he practices out of Washington, D.C. Um, I also have a whole story about how this was supposed to go versus how this did go due to COVID. Um, I know so many people out there have had surgeries canceled, rescheduled, uh, moved to different locations. Um, and all sorts of other complications due to coronavirus. Um, there's extra steps now that you have to take because of coronavirus and preventative measures um, for surgery in general because of um, the pandemic. So um, I'm gonna explain a little bit of that because if you're out there and you're trying to get surgery um, during this pandemic, this will be important to you. So I originally was going to go to Dr. Grunwald, um, Dr. G is what I called her. Um, and what my friends called her because I had multiple friends go to her. She works out of the Children's Hospital at UPMC in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I actually think she went into private practice. In fact, I know she did, but I don't have all of that information. Um, I apologize, but you can find her, Dr. Grunewald, Lorelai Grunewald. Um, she was awesome. I was very excited after my consultation with her. Um, her bedside manner was great. She was very um, informative. She took the time to talk to me about all of my questions and concerns. Um, and I was set up, that, that consultation was in February. And I, false, I'm sorry. That consultation was in December. And I had scheduled a top surgery appointment for March. Um, then coronavirus happened. 
Unfortunately, my first um, scheduling was canceled. I was very disappointed, but it was the very beginning of the pandemic and things were scary. So I um, was understanding. I was aware of what was happening and I knew that although for me, this surgery is medically necessary um, and I have a therapist letter to prove so, um, this was life-saving, this was something I needed, but I, I, I understood that there are people out there who, with coronavirus first starting, medical equipment, doctors, surgeons, they needed to focus on that, and I understood the risks for me and the other people at the hospital if I were to get that surgery at that time. So, unfortunately, that was canceled. Um, they rescheduled me for late April um, with hopes that coronavirus would just dissipate and go away and be better. And unfortunately, as we know, that did not happen. So my second surgery date was also canceled. Um, and during that time, my fiance and I also moved cross country. Um, well, like 400 miles cross country, cross state. It doesn't matter. We moved during a pandemic. Uh, we moved back to about 30 minutes from where I grew up. Um, we had been in Pittsburgh for six years and I'm back in Maryland now, so I decided that I could reschedule with Dr. Grunwald in Pittsburgh and travel and stay in an Airbnb for recovery. Um, I just, I ended up, it was, it was too many expenses, too much stress to figure out how to travel, how to afford to travel for that long. If I were to have a post-op complication, how was I gonna get back to my surgeon in time? It would be a six hour drive. I just felt that it wasn't the best thing for me and my surgery. So I kind of started from page one and researched surgeons in the Maryland, Delaware, Virginia area. Um, and I came across Dr. Amanini, um, who again, I said he works out of Washington DC. His office building, West End Plastic Surgery is um, downtown DC, a couple, very close to the White House actually. Um, when we drove up there, it was about an hour and a half drive for us for the consultation. Um, my fiance could not come in with me. I had to go in alone, um, which was fine. I had already been through a consultation. I kind of knew the drill. Um, and that was because of coronavirus and limiting the amount of people in and out of the medical building. Um, so I did that alone. I got all the information I needed. I set a date for August. So I think my consultation was in June and I set a date for August 18th. So he was very quick and efficient, um, no problems. Um, their whole staff has been amazing at communicating with me. Um, his office specifically is known for being extremely good at getting the insurance companies that they work with to provide full coverage um, for their patients. So I am lucky enough that I have full coverage for this, um, this procedure. Hey. hey. Okay, I'm back. Hannah's roller skating in the house because it is rainy and gross outside and she has to roller skate every day. So I think I have to go rewatch that video to figure out what I was saying. I'll be right back. Dr. Ramanini and his staff have been fantastic. They have been so helpful every step of the way. Um, I'm in almost constant email communication with his um, office staff about scheduling, about pre-op instructions, about um, taking my coronavirus test, which was another step that I had to complete. Um, they told me they could write a script to get the test locally, uh, which we have a local testing center, um, but I ended up deciding that I wanted to go to their testing facility to get the test done, um, just because that was the only way that they could guarantee that it would be free of charge for me and that they would receive um, the results within the time frame before surgery. Um, I had to get the test done within one week of surgery um, so that the results were you know, still applicable when I have the surgery. Um, if I would have gotten the test three weeks ago, I could have contracted the virus between that time. So since it had to be so close to surgery and I was worried about them not receiving my results in time, I decided to go to Washington DC, take another day trip out of it and get my coronavirus test, which uh, they called me within 48 hours um, and I was negative. So that's good. 
after my coronavirus test results have come back negative, that was kind of my final thing that I really had to do um, as far as the coronavirus procedures um, go. Um, I am not allowed to have Hannah or my mom, who's also coming with me, um, come into the um, building. They did say that um, they could wait in the main lobby of the building, which isn't even the surgical center, um, but they would have to wear masks and wait for hours. And I don't know, I just, I'm a little bummed that I can't have my support system there with me um, and I have to go through pre-op and wait for surgery by myself. I'm a pretty anxious person, so I don't necessarily think that I will do well in that situation, but I am doing my very best to stay positive because this surgery I have been waiting for and I'm so excited for, and I'm not gonna let that little coronavirus factor get in the way. I mean, I've already had so many hurdles to get here that I don't mind. I'm getting the surgery, I it's paid for, I, yeah, great. I did mention that my insurance 100% covered the procedure, which is true. Um, I do have a copay, um, but my insurance was covered the whole procedure, the anesthesia, all of that. Um, and I do, I did opt for um, liposuction um, to remove any possibility of dog ears. And if you don't know what that is, um, that's the fat that is right here. After you have this procedure, imagine being totally flat, but still having that extra fat in your like armpit region. Um, yeah, I, I didn't want that look. Um, my doctor, Dr. Ramanini, recommended that if I were to um, have the double incision that looks more androgynous and I want the, the scars to be slightly higher and very straight up here, rather than under the, um, pec muscle and round, I don't want that look because to me that kind of images where my breasts used to be and kind of the whole point is to remove that. So I'm going to have straight high scars and because of that, this armpit pat, oh, armpit fat, armpit pat, armpit fat, this armpit fat <clears throat> would be pretty obvious because the rest of the fat on my chest would be completely gone and flat. So I opted to do liposuction under the armpits. Um, this doesn't really complicate surgery or make it any more difficult, especially since I opted out of nipple grafts. Um, it, my surgery is only 45 minutes, so it's very simple, very straightforward. So basically I'm going in um, at 10 o'clock um, and I have to wait until one or two for my surgery. Technically I was given the time of two o'clock, um, but when I got my appointment confirmation today, it said one o'clock um, and they said the surgery time is subject to change up to the day of surgery. So yeah, I'm arriving at 10. My mom is meeting us at the house at 8 a.m. We are driving all together to Washington DC. We'll be there by 10. Um, I will go in by myself. I'll check in, I'll have all my pre-op screenings, I will go through pre-op, I will go to surgery, which will take 45 minutes, and then I believe that Hannah and my mom will be allowed to come into the building and make sure that I'm dressed and checked out and they will have um, a little rundown on how to take care of my drains um, and any other post-op care that I won't really be able to take in because I will be loopy, so yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'd also like to mention that I am being prescribed Vicodin, I believe, um, or Oxy, and I am not going to take it. Um, I just don't really want to ever take narcotics if I don't have to. Um, I have a medical marijuana card, which my doctor knows about, and he um, said that it was a great idea to just try to use medical cannabis as my pain management um, rather than trying the, um, the narcotics. So that's my goal, is to just use cannabis and Tylenol as needed um, post-op, but we'll see. I'm definitely gonna pick up the narcotics so that I have them just in case. I'm worried that I'm gonna come home the first day and be like, I got this, I'm fine, and then not be fine at all. So I'm gonna have them here just in case, but the treatment plan for me is medical cannabis, which I will not be smoking because Coughing will not be good. So I have liquid THC, I have edibles, I have topicals. 
I'm prepared and ready for pain management post-op. So, I think that's everything that I needed to cover pre-op. Um, I'm excited. I'm nervous about recovery mostly. Um, I'm a little sad and I think people don't talk about the almost grieving process of losing part of your body. Um, I sometimes feel weird about talking about it because I think that people may think that I'm going to have regrets or that I don't actually want to do this and this is the wrong decision for me. But what it is for me is I've had this body my whole life and I don't know anything different. And although I know that I'm not 100% at home and comfortable in this body, I don't know what I'll look like or feel like without my chest. And that's scary. That's just a scary thing to encounter. So despite wanting to move forward with this with my whole heart, I am a little scared and I am grieving a little because this is part of me, you know? I was, I was kind of joking and I was asking Hannah like, what are they gonna do with my boobs? Are they gonna be medical waste? Are they gonna throw them out? Are they gonna burn them? It's kind of like the ultimate bra burning, like, but yeah, so let me give you a little basic, sorry, my room is crazy right now. We got a bunch of bones on the bed, some clothes on the floor, sorry about it. I'm just gonna give you a full body shot of my body, what it looks like now, um, and then I'll do the same thing post-op a couple times give you some updates. So here I am. This is my body pre-op. Let's go check out what Hannah and the dogs are doing and then I will log off here. Let me also show you guys this tub of post-op care items that I have next to the bed so that I can easily reach them or Hannah can help me. I have this nice neck pillow that is definitely necessary. I have a drain post-op shirt, which buttons up the front, which is really important. And it has drain pockets, so that when I have my drains, they can easily hang in here and I won't get them caught on anything. So I have that as well. Then I have some rolled gauze in case I need to reapply myself. I also have stool softeners, which are really important because apparently after surgery, you do not use the bathroom as often as you would like. And that helps with that trouble. Bio oil for scar care. And this is to massage my scars. A lot of you use these on your faces with lotion, etc. This is to massage your scars so that you do not have any sort of um, lumps or hard tissue or scar tissue that builds up. I also have Zequil, just in case I'm unable to sleep in an uncomfortable position because I can't lay on my stomach or side for a couple weeks and I am a stomach and side sleeper. So I'm nervous about that. Now this is to help so I don't roll over onto my side during my sleep and hurt myself or move my drain, which would not be great. So this is to help me sleep and sleep on my back comfortably. <laughs> 